Chris Cotinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon here on YouTube, and then I post it up to social media. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka, done. I'd like to thank my sponsor, BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash Chris Cotinas. They're an online therapy company. They are international. Anywhere in the world, you can get to them. Just go to betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas, fill out a questionnaire, and they will place you with a licensed professional therapist, either in your state or that can do international um, therapy. All right. So thank you, BetterHelp. Okay. Um, today's, well, hold on. Let me, huh. okay. So touring, I'm going to be out on tour. Hello, everybody. I'm going to be out on tour. So here are the dates. John is going to post them in the chat. So Houston, Texas, April 13th. Pensacola, Florida will be April 20th. Charleston, South Carolina will be May 4th. Richmond, Virginia will be June 22nd. Washington, D.C. will be July 20th. York, Pennsylvania, that's the new one that I've added, is going to be August 5th. Uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania will be August 10th. And there are going to be more um, dates as I figure out my schedule and what I'm doing and all that sort of good stuff. So we are going to be doing Ohio, probably Tennessee. So as soon as we figure out where we're, where we're going and what we're doing, then I will let you guys know. Um, <clears throat> cough choke. So, okay. So that is, that is that, um, current events, kind of a sad one. So some of you may know this because you you follow my LPC page I have on um, Facebook. My friend, Sam, William Sam Gregory passed away. Like I found out about it, like literally right after the show last week. And I'm doing this as a current event because he was an amazing man. He was kind. He was funny. He was talented. He was a playwright. He was a poet. And he had basically lived his entire life taking care of elderly relatives, whether that was his dad and then his mom and then an aunt or other relatives that needed taking care of. So he finally decided, you know, I'm 56. I, I'm going to, you know, everybody's gone. I'm going to go live my life. I'm, I'm going to go do what I want to do. So he came down to the Southwest to look for a place to live. And so he, he looked at, at, at Palm Springs and I think that's probably where he was going to land, but he wanted to stay in, in the Gilbert area because he wanted to come visit with us. So he went to Tucson, he went to Gilbert, he went to Mesa, he went to Tempe, he went, you know, he just kind of bebopped around trying to see where he wanted to be. So we had arranged to meet him for the Academy Awards because he and I both love actors and acting and, you know, things like that. We wanted to see the dresses and the outfits and everything. And I last heard from him on Thursday, didn't hear from him on Friday, didn't think too much about it. I kind of thought, well, maybe he's busy or whatever. But then John sent him a reminder text. Hey, we'll see you Sunday at, you know, 1.30, nothing. And then we started calling and it went straight to voicemail. And then John went to the hotel to see if everything was okay. And he apparently had died of a massive heart attack Friday night. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I don't want any of you to wait. Don't wait to live your life that we don't, you don't have the time you think you do is what I'm trying to say. Sam thought he had all the time in the world. You know, I'm done with my relatives and now I'm going to go live my life. Well, no, not so much. He started to, which was really cool. It was really awesome to watch and awesome to see. But the thing I want to get across to everyone is that life is short and you just don't know. Okay. And that's why you want to get out of bad situations like abuse and go live your best life. Seriously, don't wait. Don't suffer any more than you need to. And don't put off traveling. Don't put off seeing the world. Don't put off letting the world see you. It's important. And, and it's we come up with all sorts of excuses. Oh, I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to, do, I have to, I have to, I have to. Listen, at the end of the day, you're not going to care about how many hours of overtime you worked or, you know, how much you, uh, I don't know, stayed in a bad relationship. Sam's last words, apparently, to the paramedics 
is what we were told is that he was saying, please make sure Chris and John are okay. And they know I'm in the hospital. It's people. People are what we are going to remember in our last moments. It's not stuff. It's not things. It's not jobs. It's not things that are ridiculous. You know, narcissists, that's their thing. They, oh, oh, they want all the stuff and the things and the blah, 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 blah. But when they die, oh my God, they're terrified. I have yet to see one that died that wasn't terrified. Sam was not terrified. He was he was thinking he would be okay. And that, yeah, so just make sure they're okay and tell them I'm in the hospital. So anyway, I bring this up because now, live in the now. Don't live in a future. Don't live in the past. Live in the now. Go take that exciting adventure. Go do that thing that you've always wanted to do. Get out of that horrible relationship. Go live your life. Be happy. You know, just do it. Just do it. So that is my current event for today. Sorry to be a bit of a downer, but that's kind of what was up. And it was just really weird. It was like, you know, John got told by the front desk and then we called the cousin and the cousin was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't have your number, you know, and then we talked for a while and she's like, okay, well, we're going to have a memorial service and another friend, Tony is coming down to pick up his stuff and surreal, just surreal. And it's, it's almost like John said, he's like, I kept expecting Sam to pop around the corner and be like, Oh, I was just kidding. You know, he wouldn't do something like that, but you know, it's just, it's weird. It's really, I think this is the first of my, close contemporaries to drop dead. So that was a bit of a whew, shock. And um, the only good thing I can say is that Sam and I are kind of cut out of the same cloth. So we never parted without saying I love you or how much I appreciate you or how awesome you are or, you know, what a good friend you are. Thank you. I'm having so much fun having you down here. I mean, it was great having him come and visit. So I think that's the thing. It's like, if you have people in your life you love, tell them daily. Don't wait. It's it's not like you're going to hoard it and save it for later. You know, you want to live your life without regrets. And, and I'm glad that John and I and Sam told us, you know, each other how much we cared about each other and how much we liked each other and how grateful we were for each other. So do it, <laughs> you know. Spread the love. It's like, if you got people you love and you appreciate, tell them. If you got people that are jack wagons and making your life miserable, kick them to the curb and go live your life and go be awesome and go have fun and send me postcards wherever you go because I think that would be really cool. So, um, so I can live vicariously. Where'd you go? Ooh, that sounds like a cool place. Put that on my bucket list, you know? So anyway, that's that. So this kind of ties into the topic today of loneliness. So loneliness is a part of our healing journey when we leave an abusive relationship. It is it is something that therapists don't generally talk about, but this is why people get out of a bad relationship or get out of a bad family thing and then dive headfirst right into another bad relationship or another dysfunctional friendship or another whatever. So we're going to talk about loneliness. So lonely, lonely is basically when we have abandoned ourselves. So when we work on our self-esteem, when we work on knowing who we are, knowing what we want, there's really not much room for loneliness. Now, there's a difference between isolation and lonely. Okay. Isolation is what our abusers did to us, you know, kept us far, far away from everybody, made sure we didn't have friends, made sure we couldn't go be with our friends, um, excommunicated our family from us, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's isolated. That's extremely lonely because it's isolation. It's a torture. It really is because we are, how do I put it? Pack animals. Basically we thrive when we are with our people more or less. So basically when we come out of an abusive family situation, first of all, they've trained us to think that isolation is normal. It is not. Let's just, let's just clear that up right now. Isolation is not normal. We need other people. We just do. We, we just do, you know? So they train us that isolation is normal. 
It is not. They also train us that, oh, you know, this is something my mother always said, you're a loner, you're a loner, you're lo like, it was a badge of honor or something. And I realized growing up as I left and I got out of there, I was like, no, actually I'm not. I actually like hanging out with friends. You know, I'm not a loner. Thank you. So they normalize the torture basically that their family taught them and that they then turned around and taught us. So being a loner, being uh, isolated, that is not normal. That is not normal. So loneliness comes from not knowing who we are and what we want, more importantly. So along with all of that, they also normalize codependency. So codependency is where we have to do everything for somebody else, always, all the time. Can't do it for ourselves, have to do it for everybody else. And it's not okay for us to take care of ourselves, okay? And that is abandoning ourselves, not taking care of ourselves, not exercising, not eating right, not hanging out with friends, not, you know, that is abandoning who we really are. So getting back to who we really are is hugely important. Breaking those mistaken thoughts and those mistaken beliefs about who we are. So a lot of my clients coming out of those relationships, when they start doing self-care, they can't even allow themselves to enjoy, for example, a pedicure or a massage or doing reading a book, curling up on the couch, reading a book. I should be doing, I should, I could, I would. Oh, who is that coming from? I can guarantee it. It's coming from your abuser. This is the tape that your abuser shoved in your head. So they don't allow the target of abuse to ever relax and to ever just enjoy and to ever just be. So it's like every action that we're doing has to have a purpose. That's a little crazy go nuts. So not every action has to have a purpose. The purpose of relaxation is to, you know, relax. The purpose of socializing is to, you know, socialize. There's no hidden agenda, but with an abuser, it's always got to be, you've got to be doing something. You've got to be productive. You've got to da 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 So we have this combination of thinking that isolation is normal and being a loner is normal and being alone all the time, not even with ourselves is normal. It's not. And then they also do the whole, well, it's got to be productive. It's got to be productive. You know, one of my dad's favorite things to do, which to this day, I cannot stand the sound of chainsaws is if everybody was asleep, you know, sun's coming up, it's like five o'clock in the morning in the, in the summertime, he'd turn on the chainsaw and he'd start sawing stuff down for no apparent reason, just to wake everybody up. Because, oh, well, we need to be productive. No, we don't. We don't live on a farm. It is not 1800. Thank you very much. And you're an attorney. So sit down and shut the fuck up. Sorry. Anyway. So the point being is loneliness is not our normal state. It is a state of fear, however. So when we come out of those relationships, we come out of the family of origin, we come out of the abusive romantic relationship, and now we are <clears throat> alone we truly feel alone because we have not worked on ourselves. We have not done the work. We have not worked the self-esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi. We have not worked the disease to please by Harriet Breaker or facing codependency by Pia Melody. We have not done the work. You've got to do the work. And the biggest friend in your life that you're going to have, because think about this, we come into this world alone. We go out of this world alone, really. And in between, guess who we're with 100% of the time? That would, that, would, that, would, that would be ourselves. Yeah. So you might as well make friends with yourself and be kind to yourself and figure out, what do you want? Really? What, 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 what do you want? What do you want to do? So I wanted to pull up some articles that I pulled off of uh, Psychology Today Hold, please. And it's funny because this first one is called, What Do You Want? Do You Ever Ask, your, ask Yourself? All right. And this is by Nancy Collier, and she's a LCSW. And this was written in January 30th, 2024 on Psychology Today. Uh, okay. So she's talking about how she was in her 20s, and she rented a beach house with a friend of hers for a holiday weekend. And she had a long list of things to do, like to do, to do, to do, to do. And her friend, when she approached her with this long list of things to do, she's like, nah, I don't want to do that, which is very similar to when John and I went to Tahiti 
And my niece, who was very caught up in that to do, to do, to do, to do thing at that time, was like, you know, well, I want to do this and I want to do that. And you, you've you got to come with me. And I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm sitting my ass here on the beach with this dog that belongs to the neighbor who apparently loves me. And I'm going to pet the dog and stare at the ocean. And that's what I did. And it was fantastic. I went swimming and I ate fresh fruit. It was awesome. But I had the strength of knowing who I am and knowing what I wanted to say, no, I don't want to do that without explanation. And her friend did that. So no explanation. So in this story that I've got off of psychology today, the friend did it too, with no justifications or apologies. Just, nope, I don't want to. You guys go and have fun. Um, how simple is it for you? And she remember, you know, how simple is it for you to ask for what you want or to say no to things? This is part of self-esteem. This is part of not being self-abandoning. Um, she remembered thinking, wow, this is how, how could this be so simple? And furthermore, how does what you want have anything to do with anything? How do you talk about your own experience as if it matters? Because our experiences to our abuser never mattered. And so we think that what we want does not matter. And fundamentally, how are you allowed to make choices based on what you want? That's something we got to start doing. I don't think I've ever actually asked myself if I wanted to go bike riding. This is in the story. Um, it was just something I did because I should. Because it was something I should be doing, living a fully active vacation. I had learned to ask myself what I want. Had I learned to ask myself what I wanted, the answer might well have been no for many things that I did. But it wasn't a question that would have occurred to me or one that even seemed relevant because of the self abandonment. So we run these tapes that keep us alone, keep us separate, keep us out of our own body, out of our own experience. And we don't ever ask ourselves, what do we want? Okay. That's huge. And so then we, we keep busy, busy, busy. And that's a trauma response. And this has to do with loneliness. Okay. Cause we're not staying in the present moment. We're not working on our wants and our needs. We're not, you know, doing the work. We're not getting with a therapist that keeps us stuck in looking outside of ourselves. Oh, well, this thing's going to make me happy or that person's going to make me happy or this person in that thing is going to make me happy. No, it's an inside job. You got to work on yourself and you've got to know what you want. What do you want? Really? It's okay. It's okay to ask yourself that. And it's okay to say the answer out loud. I have had so many clients that when I brought this up to them would burst into tears because of two things. One, no one had ever given them permission to ask for what they want. And two, they were terrified of being punished as if there was some nebulous floating abuser that was just going to come by and go bonk on the head. But that's what we think. And that's an inner child thing. So inner child workbook, Catherine Taylor, or the one by Lucia Cappuccioni. So you got to work on all of this stuff. It is all interconnected. It is not separate. Mind, body, spirit, not separate. All these issues, not separate. So this all has to do with loneliness. Okay. So um, the idea that anyone could make decisions based on just experience and actually ask for what she wanted felt fascinating and shocking. Utterly unknown, at the, but at the same time, deeply interesting and enticing. It woke up a curiosity in me that never fully went back to sleep and with it, deep longing to learn this for myself. It wasn't until I reached my 40s that I started asking myself what I want or don't want and considering what experiences actually feel like for me. It wasn't even until later in life that I built the courage to express my wants and don'ts out loud. Do it now. Express your wants and don'ts out loud. First of all, you got to figure out what your wants and don'ts are. Okay. It's like, seriously, like this all has to do back with Sam. It's like, what do you want? What do you don't want? Where, where do you want to go? Where don't you want to go? What, who do you want in your life? Who don't you want in your life? Um, for many people, the time comes usually in our tweens when we make a kind of deal with the devil. We feel like we have to choose between who we really are and being liked. Being real feels too dangerous as it comes with the risk of rejection, especially if we live in a family that's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and judgmental and harsh and critical. Um, Okay, so let's see. Being in a relationship with other people is more important than being in relationship with ourselves. So here we get 
to the root of a loan. So we are trained, trained by our abusive family, by the codependency, by the low self-esteem, by the everything that we don't matter, that other people matter more than us, and that we are nothing unless we have a partner or a friend or, you know, and so, but we end up picking someone because this is the inner child again, causing problems. God love that little inner child. So the inner child looks outside of themselves and goes, oh my God, oh my God, I'm terrified. I'm terrified. I can't be alone. I can't be alone. I can't be alone. That's the lie we tell ourselves. So again, there's a difference between abandonment and being alone. So what's going on with the inner child, the inner child was abandoned. So whoever the abuser was, was neglectful, abandoning, harmful, hurtful, hateful, abusive, et cetera. So when we get rid of them, now we've got that tape running in our head. We're not even usually aware of it. We've got to drag that bad boy into the light and then we've got to rip it up and get rid of it and start working on who are we, what do we want, okay? And meanwhile, that inner child is going to freak right the bleep out, okay? Like totally, the inner child's going to be like, <gasps> Oh my God, I can't be alone. I can't be alone. I can't be alone. Yes, you can. Yes, absolutely. You can. It's safe. It is. And you've got to keep telling yourself that. So this is a little bit about self-soothing as well. It is okay to be alone and work on yourself and learn who you are and get back into a really good, healthy relationship with your wants and your needs. It's okay. It's okay. So comforting that inner child, comforting that inner child. So that inner child is going to try to recreate the family of origin. So here's the mom and dad or whoever you had the hardest relationship with. It's going to look outside and go, oh, somebody who kind of sort of reminds me of them. I know if I can make that person over there love me, I prove mom and dad or whoever the caregiver was wrong. Half of a doo-doo sandwich, half of a doo-doo sandwich, pfft, total doo-doo sandwich. And you start the cycle all over again. This is why it is so dangerous for people to dive right into relationships, romantic relationships, either when they've left the family of origin or when they've left an abusive romantic relationship or even a, a friendship. You don't want to dive into another relationship until you have thoroughly figured yourself out. Seriously, you just don't. Okay, <clears throat> hold on while I get back to this. Um, okay. So we get, uh, we got, <laughs> because of the family of origin, we get called selfish and that we should feel guilty and how dare we take care of ourselves and how dare we have wants and needs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is all because of the abusive family and or the abusive partner. So <clears throat> getting rid of the codependency, getting rid of the idea that taking care of ourselves is somehow evil and bad and wrong. And I've actually had clients that were very religious go, oops, I need to turn my sound off. Um, go, I can't take care of myself. I'm selfish. You know, I, uh, 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 you know, and then I'd have to be like, stop, you know, let's work within your frame of religion. You're a child of God. A good parent wants their kid to be taken care of. You know, it's just, you gotta realize that a lot of times abusers use religion, whether, whether it's Buddhism or Christianity or Islam or you know, Hindi or whatever, they use it to manipulate. They use it, they take things out of context and they use it to get their own way. And getting their own way means you don't take care of yourself. Getting their, their own way means that they project their selfishness onto you so that you think it's you. And they don't want healthy people around them. Think about this, guys. If we're healthy, if we know our worth, we're not going to put up with their crap at all, ever. Not on this or any other planet. You see where I'm going with that? So, of course, they want you to be in a state of fear, <clears throat> in a state of not taking care of yourself, in a state of just abject cognitive dissonance. Taking care of yourself is the first step to absolute good, healthy self-esteem. Now with the codependency part, I also hear, but, but, but I should be taking care of these other people and I should be doing this. I, you're doing that 99.999999% of the time. You cannot pour from an empty cup. You must take care of yourself. You must recharge and refill yourself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and otherwise in order to be of help and of service to other people. 
So if you really are interested in being of help and service, go take that nap, go eat that good food, go stare at the ceiling for 20 minutes, do what you need to do to recharge. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing bad about that. There's nothing selfish about that. There's nothing evil about that. That All of that crap that they told you that self-care was is for their own gain so that you continue to serve them, not yourself or your higher power, if that makes any sort of sense. So hold on. All right. So lonely. Being lonely is a feeling. It's about being disconnected from others and not having the kind of social contact and communion you want with other people which is intentional on the part of the abusers. So Will Wheaton in his book, uh, Still Just a Geek, I just got the copy a couple of weeks ago. John got it for me for my birthday. He signed it. I'm so excited. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> speaking of geeks. Anyway, um, he talked about how when he meets people at Comic-Cons, it's almost like he can tell the ones that have been abused by their family because it's almost like we all kind of know the same things, you know, and there's like this secret handshake and secret society that none of us wanted to belong to. And he's right. It's like all of our parents, if we came from a family of abusive people, and if we were in a romantic relationship, they make it awkward. They don't teach us how to have communication and commune with other people. We always feel like we're standing outside kind of looking in. Always. Always. And I, I still feel that to a certain extent. I just kind of push through it and just be like, yep, nope, that, yep, thank you, you know. And part of it is, I think, the shame that we have from all of the crap that our parents did to us. Like, almost like we have the letter A on our forehead, you know, it's like adultery, but you know, it's not adultery, but abuse, you know, and it's kind of like, yeah, people are going to know, well, you know what? So what? So what? We survived. And, and I think that's kind of the point that Will Wheaton was talking about in his book. It's like, yeah, we belong to this club that none of us wanted to be in, but you know what? We all freaking survived and we all found our way. And that is something to be really proud of. So, and the people that should be, that should be ashamed are the abusers and they're not because they don't have the empathy cog, but we need to let go of that shame. We need to let go of that fear of rejection. It's like if people reject, okay, that's them, you know, there it is, you know, and you can't take things personally. And a lot of us take things personally and you can't because it's not. Most people are so in their heads. It's not about you. Trust me. So, okay. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, it's about how you perceive the world around you and it's related to your own particular needs and wants, which is why you need to know what your needs are. And wants are, if you don't know what your needs and wants are, you're going to be going to a well that's dry and not just dry, but possibly salted and poisoned. You got to know what your needs and wants are. And you got to know where you can get your needs and wants met. You know, like if, if I went and hung out with people who were very shallow and into looks and, and narcissistic, I would never make friends ever, you know? So I don't do that. I go hang out with Shatha, who's my trainer and also my friend. And I hang out with Roseanne, who's like-minded. And, you know, it's like it, you go and you talk to people who are like-minded. You don't go try to appease somebody who's not ever going to get you. And I find a lot of clients do that. It's like they go start repeating those patterns. I need to twist myself into a pretzel to be loved. I need to twist myself into a pretzel to be accepted. I need to, no, you don't. You just need to be you. And the right people will show up. So, okay. Um, it's subjective. Some people might want a lot of connection and feel lonely if they have to spend even a bit of time alone, which is a self-esteem issue. So you really want to work on loving yourself. So something that I did with Shatha on Wednesday is we went to a belly dance goddess class. And basically it was like, put on the music move however you want, but make eye contact with yourself in the mirror. And when negative thoughts come up, challenge them and replace them immediately with a positive. So it was, it was a little bit of cognitive behavioral therapy along with dance, along with, you know, aerobics. Oh my God, I thought I was going to die. I danced for an entire hour. Holy cow. But it was awesome because we are so disconnected from who we really are when we come out of abusive relationships 
that it's really important to do things like that. And no, it is not narcissistic. Narcissism is always, you know, tell me how great I am. Tell me how great I am. it's outside. Give me, 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 right? Self-esteem is you looking in the mirror, doing a belly dance move, you know, and going, huh, oh, my gosh, I can still do this. This is awesome. Wow. Hi. You know, I mean, that's self-esteem. That is just loving yourself in the moment, you know, and that's what you want. That is what you want. So, okay, hold on. Let me get back to this. Um, okay. Uh, All right. So social isolation, that is one thing, but being alone in a room full of people, that is a, that is an R issue, not a their issue. It's like, okay, what's going on in your head? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? You know, are you making yourself wrong? Are you putting yourself down? Work on the self-esteem, work on the self-esteem, seriously. So, because some people can be surrounded by a whole room full of people and still feel incredibly alone. And, and I think that's a lot of us as survivors and we have to get over that. It's kind of like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to go say hi if they reject me. Okay. Oh, well, that, their problem. They're missing out. Thank you very much. You know, and you don't ever take things personally. And we always take things personally because it was personal when we were growing up. Or when we were in that abusive relationship, it was personal. So coming out of those relationships, we're still dealing with the cognitive dissonance. We're still dealing with the mistaken thoughts and the mistaken beliefs and all of that stuff. And in our inner child's mind, I need someone. I need someone. I need to dive into another relationship. I need to get another friendship. I need to da, 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 da. looking outside. That's a carryover. That's a flea. That's a flea we picked up from the abuser. So it's not about outside of us, guys. It's about inside of us. It's about waking up in the morning, looking in the mirror, greeting yourself. Hi, good to see you. Have a great day. You know what? I give you permission to have fun and be as goofy as you need to be. There you go. You know, or whatever it is you're working on. So there is that. It's like you give yourself permission to be. And when that self-esteem gets rocking and rolling and you don't always need the mirror to do it, like it just suddenly starts happening in and of itself and on its own, or you find yourself, you walk by a mirror and you go, hi, I like you. That's self-esteem. That is all self-esteem. And that's what you want. And people who've got good self-esteem don't mind spending time alone because the thoughts up here are kind and they're supportive and they're gentle and they're healthy. Okay. Generally when we're diving into another relationship or looking for that other friendship or gimme, 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 it's because we don't want to hear what's going on up here, which is why you got to work on what's going on up there consciously, not subconsciously, so that you can pull it into the light, analyze it, figure it out, kick it to the curb, replace it with the positive and continue on with your life. Okay. Hold on. Uh, okay. I'm going to get to the questions in just a second. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, so this is the second part of the article, uh, or this other article is why being alone isn't loneliness. Um, and this is by Alexander Danvers. So basically it's about us abandoning ourselves, not paying attention to our wants and needs, not working on ourselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, time spent alone does not at all predict loneliness. So loneliness is when we have abandoned ourselves, when we do not pay attention to our wants and needs, when we do not listen to our gut, when we haven't worked on ourselves, when we don't do the self-esteem, when we don't do the mirror work, that every time we do that, we're abandoning ourselves. All of this is self-care. And all of this helps us to be able to communicate and commune with other people. So it benefits us to do the work. So there is that. Okay. The last article is uh, transcending loneliness and finding true love. Um, and this is written by Hal Shorey, PhD. This is um, transcending loneliness and finding true love. Uh, okay. So what ends up happening when we come out of these relationships, our abuser has taught us to live in a fantasy land you know, and project. Those are all fleas. So we have this idealized fantasy that some other person outside of us is going to make us feel better, that we're going to get true love and 
um, you know, idealized love and it's going to be perfect and da, 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 da. And it is again, falling for an illusion. So you don't want to do that. And I think that's why so many people, when they come out of an abusive relationship, dive right back into another one because the fear of the thoughts is huge. And the fear of being alone with the thoughts, which really is like being alone with the abuser, is huge. That's why you need a really, 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 really good trauma therapist. And you need to start working the workbook, CPTSD, From Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker, Disease to Please, Harriet Breaker, uh, Facing Codependency by Pia Melody, <clears throat> the Self-Esteem Workbook by Glenn Schiraldi, uh, any and all of them, uh, the Inner Child Workbook, Catherine Taylor, or the one by uh, Lucia Cappuccioni. So we have these idealized fantasies. You got to figure out how old are you in that moment when you're like, I must have another relationship. How old are you? How old are you? You need the relationship with yourself. Get back into relationship with what you want, what you need. What are your goals? What's your plan? You know, and be okay with that. A lot of times we've been so harshly criticized and so harshly neglected and or abused. We don't trust ourselves. And it's about getting back into that relationship of trusting your gut, knowing who you are, knowing what you want and going for it. So instead of idealizing someone else, which is what happens when we fall in love with an abuser, because remember they present as the perfect person, you know, and we go, Oh, this is great. They're, they're, the, they're what I want. This is what I need. Instead of looking in the mirror and going, this is great. You're what I want. You're what I need. Do you see where I'm going with that? So, and no, that is not narcissism. We do need ourselves. If we abandon ourselves, we are leaving ourselves open to falling for another abuser. So relationships with real people, five things you can do to have relationships with real, not projected people. Take a look at the idealized standards you hold and realize that this is an idea sold to you by prior generations and or your society and or your abuser. The ideal is an illusion that leads us to objectify others and that treat real people typically, and I'm sorry, and that real people typically cannot and should not carry. Grieve your dream of the one. So that's because our abusers have told us lies, you'll never succeed without me. You're never going to find anybody like me. God, I hope not. You know, you'll you'll never you'll never love again. You'll never blah 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 blah. We're terrified that we are somehow defective and not good enough and blah 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 blah. That's the inner critic. That's the inner critic. You got to tell the inner critic, "Thank you for your input. Shut the bleep up. Why? Cuz I say so." And then replace it with the positive. I am lovable. I am going to find somebody else again, but right now I need to find myself. Thanks for playing. Bye-bye. Go pound sand. Do you see where I'm going with that? So, um, <clears throat> oh, the, the idea that, oh, I'm never going to find it. So I had a client recently that said that. I'm never going to love again. No one will ever understand me. No one will ever get me, blah, 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 blah. And I stopped. And I said, stop. There are 8 billion people on the face of this planet. Are you telling me statistically that there's not somebody else out there that will get you? So yeah, then when that kind of kicked in, she was like, oh, okay, let's talk about where that came from. Who told you that? And then we started working through the abuser and the dad and all of this stuff. Do you see where I'm going with this? So you've really got to analyze your thoughts. Don't assume that they're correct. The abuser lied to us. If this is an automatic thought from the abuser, it's a lie. If their lips were moving, they were lying. So, okay. So there is that. Um, Yes, other people can help you mend, but you need to do the heavy lifting and learn to love yourself first. Don't have different rules for relationships, you know, and friendships. It's like, do not accept behavior from a friend that you wouldn't accept from anybody else, you know? So um, learn to live a full life without a romantic relationship. You might want it, but it is best it, but it is best to not need it. Fill your heart with experience of life well-lived and with other authentic people. So I totally am on board with that because I think that's what's happening with us is it's a flea that we've gotten from our abuser to idealize and to have this fantasy that this person is going to be our everything. And no person can be everyone or, you know, what any person's everything, you know? So, <clears throat> all right. So here we go. Loneliness can be overcome by working on the self. So here's your list of homework. What are your wants? What are your needs? 
Like really be honest and don't be like, oh, well, I want this because so-and-so wants this, or I want this because society expects this, or no, 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 they don't exist. What are your wants? What do you want out of life? What do you want in a friendship? What do you want really in a romantic relationship? Blow up the idealized stuff. Allow yourself to get real, you know? What are your deal breakers? What will you not put up with? That is huge. So you also want the list of things you do want, and you also want the list of things you do not want. And you got to honor that. So if somebody starts crossing your deal breakers, get rid of them. Kick them to the curb, okay? So a lot of people are like, but, 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 okay, how old are you? In that moment when you're but, but, butting, how old are you? Work on that inner child. So get your list of wants. What do you really want? Really? And give yourself permission. Hi, good to see you. Have a great day. You know what? It's okay to have wants and needs. I know. Shocking. But it's okay. It's okay. And sometimes you're going to have to scream that out loud because that inner critic is so loud and so threatening that it'll pop up and it'll be like, no, you can't have wants and needs. Yes, I can, mother clucker. Watch me, biatch. You know what I'm saying? That's what you got to do. You got to confront that. That is an old pattern of thinking. Don't give in to it. So, hi, good to see you. It is okay for you to have wants and needs. And ain't nobody going to tell you otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I give you permission. Nobody is going to punish you for it. And if they do, you have my permission to break your foot off in their hind end. Do you see where I'm going with that? You've got to give yourself permission because our abusers, our family of origin, they never would, they never will. So I want you to work on self-esteem. I want you to work on your wants. I want you to work on giving yourself permission. Look at yourself in the mirror. Throw on some music and dance, whether you're male or female. I don't care. Get in front of that mirror, dance, and make sure you thank your body. Wow, body, thank you for letting me be able to still do belly dancing that I haven't done in 30 years. This is freaking awesome. You know, or thank you for allowing me to walk around this planet or whatever. So just throw on music and dance and look yourself in the eye and be positive. Notice what comes up that's negative and boy, how do you excise it. You send it out. And nope, I'm not playing. I don't believe that anymore. That is an old thought. That might be something to journal about afterwards. It's like when you're done dancing, it's like, wow, here were the crazy negative thoughts I had. Here's who they really belong to. Hmm. Going to give them back to the abuser. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Go pound sand. Do you see where I'm going with that? So really there is no alone and, and scared when you're in good, healthy self-esteem, good, healthy self-esteem, the thoughts are kind, they're positive, they're helpful, they're not fearful, they're not scared, they're not sad, they're not, they're just like, hey, be bopping along, oh yeah, okay, doing the dishes, this is good, you know, that kind of thing. So you've got to really be careful, be mindful, what are you thinking? What are you thinking and how is that causing you to feel? You know, thoughts and feelings are not separate, the thoughts always come in and then the feelings happen. So it's like, okay, what was the thought? Who does it belong to? If it's not yours, send it back to them. It's not yours. So loneliness is a part of the healing process. And that is that weird growth stage where we have separated from the abuser, whether it's family of origin or romantic relationship. And now we are sitting with ourselves. And we must, if we really want to be healthy, I mean, you don't have to, it would help. Work on ourselves, work on the self-esteem. Work on loving yourself, work on respecting yourself, work on healing that inner child that never got their wants and needs heard, let alone validated. So validate yourself, validate your wants and your needs. Absolutely. Get with a good trauma therapist, work on this stuff so that you're not looking outside of yourself for healing. You're looking inside of yourself for healing. And there's plenty of work to be doing. So there's no real time to be bored and there's no real time to be alone. And a lot of time that alone is a lot of fear. And that's when you got to go to the inner child and be like, what is this up? What, what is this about? What, what is up with this? What are you doing? What's going on? How old are you? Ooh, you're young. Okay. Let me just sit with you and rock you and hold you and comfort you. What do you need? And nine times out of 10, that little kid is going to be like, I need to feel safe. I need to feel safe. I need to feel safe. Okay, well, we're not going to get safety from somebody else. It's got to come from us. So I promise I will keep you safe because I'm the adult. 
you're the kid. Let me be the adult. I will take care of you. You've got to let me run the show. So while we are alone right now, I'm going to work on self-esteem for the two of us. And that's literally what you got to do. You're reparenting that inner child. Okay, let's hit the questions. Okay, dun, dun, dun. All right. Uh, my good friend has health issues that prevent us from meeting too often. What is a good way to feel good among people without being friends with jerks? Um, okay, so basically, unfortunately, 45% of the population, in my opinion, is disordered in some way, shape, or form. Um, you're going to come across jerks. And when you come across jerks, you don't have anything to do with them. You have the right to say, no, thank you. No, thank you. So let me give you an example. Um, I've got a friend, Todd, and he has these really cool parties at his house. And um, we went there and there was this guy there that just would not leave me alone. Like he decided that I was the answer to all of his problems because I was a therapist, you know, and he was going to follow me around and tell me all his problems during the thing. And I finally looked at him and I was like, go away. I'm not interested. I, I'm not working right now. Go away. Here, If you want to make an appointment, here's my card. Go away. <laughs> you know, you got to have boundaries. So there's going to be jerks. There are. There, unfortunately, like I said, 45% of the population, 35 to 45% of the population is disordered. You're going to come across them. You just, you got to just say no. You literally, no is your friend. Use it often. Use it wisely. Use it well. You know, it's kind of like, it's it's a boundary and it's a safe word. It keeps us safe. If I had allowed this guy to continue to follow me around and tell me all his problems, I would have ended up the entire party working, essentially, you know? So you got to say no. You just got to say no. And you got to be like, nope, no, thank you. Don't want to hang out with you. And it doesn't matter they're about their widow feelings. Because remember, abusers can turn on the waterworks when they need to. But I'll tell you what, it never really reaches their eyes. Like really, like when somebody's suffering, you know it, you know, and when somebody's sad, you know it. But with an abuser, if they're, if they're psychopathic enough, they can turn on the waterworks, but not really feel it. So, um, and it's not your problem. You know, no is a complete sentence. 110%. No is a complete sentence. And it needs no explanation. You know, but why don't you like me? I actually, oh God, I had a guy in college do that. But why? Why don't you like me? Uh, because you're a psychopath. Um, you know, you know, it's just like you and I are not meant to be. Thank you. Thanks for playing. Go find somebody that really is gonna work with you because this is not gonna work. So yeah, they don't take no for an answer. And they're that's a really good, they're showing you who they are. Absolutely. You don't have to put up with people who are jerks. You don't. The older I get, the less I give flying <clears throat> clucks about, you know, jerks. I just, you know, it's not my job to feed your ego. It's not my job to appease your whatever it is you think you're doing. You know, it's like if you're going to be rude and cruel and sarcastic and nasty and no, thank you. I want nothing to do with you. Life is too short. I want to spend my life with people like Sam. You know, it's like, I want to spend my life with like-minded people that are kind and gentle and funny and, you know, hysterical and talented and creative. And I don't have time for people that are evil and mean and cruel. I don't, I don't, I don't allow them. I don't allow them. I just don't. And it doesn't matter what they think. They are responsible for their own emotions. So the next thing that they do is, oh, you made me sad or you made me, well, you chose. Bye. I don't want to be around you. And I don't need to give you an explanation. So you got to be strong with that because there's a lot of people that don't have, you know, boundaries that don't, that are disordered, that are dark triads, that are looking for their next ego meal. And you don't have to feed them. You can say no, 110%. Okay. Uh, do narcissists isolate their children and try to make them dependent on the narcissist because the narcissist is lonely? A hundred and ten percent. If you've ever watched the movie like Water for Chocolate, it's an old one. It's in Spanish. It's a great movie. The youngest child was expected to take care of the very narcissistic mother 
and give up her own life to make the mother happy so that the mother wouldn't be alone. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. They do that. They absolutely do that. That's part of the reason why my mom was so angry when I married John, because in her mind, I was going to stay single. She was going to outlive dad. And then she and I would travel around the world. She literally told me that was her plan, you know, <clears throat> And she boycotted my wedding because she was so mad that I was getting married because she couldn't fathom a guy being healthy because she'd never been around a healthy man. She was molested by her step-grandfather. Her mother was a narcissist. She married my dad, who was obviously cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, you know, and she couldn't conceive of somebody having a happy, healthy marriage. So yeah, they, it doesn't have to be narcissistic. It could be borderline. It could be any other personality disorder, but yeah, they do. They try to keep the kid with them. They try to infantilize them or they try to scare them out of relationships. That's the other thing my mom would do is that she would send me article after article after article. And I talk about it in my book, what's wrong with your dad. A lot of it was, I should have called it what's wrong with your mom too. Um, but she would send me article after article about, you know, rapes in the area or AIDS or, you know, you know other STDs, you know, because she was trying to make me not have anything to do with anyone, basically, because she wanted me to stay single and take care of her. Did not happen, thank God. So yeah, they absolutely do that. Um, do narcs know they really don't have anyone apart from the ones they abuse? I think on some level they do. Uh, I really do, because <laughs> if you've ever seen a collapsed narcissist, oh my God, the only thing I can say about collapsed narcissists, it's like you visually in your head, you just kind of see them with their little fists balled up, oh, I'll get you, uh, and they're just so angry, and they know they don't have anybody, and they are not willing to take a look at that it's them. You know, the common denominator is them, you know, and a part of them does know that, yeah, that whole, that whole lie about nobody will put up with you. They're talking about themselves. Nobody will put up with their crap. Seriously, not healthy people. Healthy people will not put up with their crap, which is why you must get healthy so that you do not put up with their crap. So yeah, they absolutely, I think there's a part of them that does know that they are going to die alone, which is why they are so terrified of death. So yeah, it's, whew, it's a thing. All right, my loves, we are running out of time. So I want to say thank you for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and share because YouTube is doing its weird thing again and I'm losing subscribers, which I don't understand. So please like, subscribe, and share. Next week, I am going to be talking about parental alienation. So I'm going to title it Siding with the Aggressor. And we're going to talk about what it is and how to mitigate it if it's already happening and how you can stop it in the first place if you can get all your ducks in a row. So, all right, my loves, go have a great week. Take very good care of yourselves. Tell the people you love, you love them. Go do the cool things. Go see the cool things. Go be, just go be, get out of the bad relationship. Go be the best revenge. Honest to God <coughs> is living well. They hate it when we live well. They hate it when we're happy, you know, so might as well, might as well go live well and be happy. So there it is. All right, my loves, I will talk to you guys later. See you on Sunday. I'll do more questions this week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And uh, then we'll be talking about parental alienation, siding with the aggressor and how to mitigate it. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.